Well, hello, everybody. My name is Mirvat al Asnaj, and I'm an interventional cardiologist in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. And here at TCT 2024 in Washington, and with me is, of course, Nicholas van Meegum from Erasmus University Medical Center. Nicholas, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invite, Mirvat. Thank you. And, you know, we're really excited because this year there's a lot of fantastic data that's coming out in the um, structural heart space, particularly with related to intervening early on patients with aortic stenosis. So, of course, the TAVR unload trial that you're presented today um, at TCT is one of them that has been highly anticipated and several other trials that perhaps maybe the future we're heading towards intervening sooner rather than later. I know um, Philippe Genereau is going to present his early TAVR trial where they're trying to see if patients after stress tests and, you know, positive stress tests uh, and watchful waiting works versus early intervention. But let's move on to the unload trial where you're looking at patients with LV dysfunction. How are you defining LV dysfunction in your trial? Yeah, th- so that's a very relevant question because I think what separates TAVR Unload from other trials so far in the space of uh, TAVR is um, the fact that this is a heart failure trial. So we are specifically looking for patients with symptomatic uh, heart failure. So patients have to be symptomatic, New York Heart Class 2 or higher, and they have to have an LV dysfunction defined as an ejection fraction below 50%. On top of that, obviously, they have to have proven moderate aortic stenosis and the uh, severity of the aortic stenosis, the moderate aortic stenosis has to be confirmed by an independent core lab prior to study enrollment. And so could you describe the design of the TAVR unload very briefly to us? Yeah. So the TAVR unload is a randomized controlled study. Uh, randomizing these symptomatic patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction on guideline-directed medical therapy with moderate aortic stenosis. Those patients are one-to-one randomized to either a transfemoral TAVR with uh, a sapient balloon expandable uh, device or um, the uh, control arm, which is basically defined as clinical aortic stenosis surveillance. And these patients uh, will only get a TAVR if the moderate aortic stenosis has progressed to severe aortic stenosis. And then the primary endpoint of the study is the hierarchical occurrence of all-cause death, disabling stroke, uh, hospitalizations for heart failure or valve-related issues or an equivalent to this hospitalization, or fourth, a change in KCCQ. And the analysis of this primary endpoint is at longest follow-up and uses the Finkelstein-Schoenfeld method. So basically will be reported as a win ratio. So, you know, since it is primarily a heart failure trial, and we're talking about patients who are optimally treated with medical therapy, um, how many of the patients were in fact optimize and reaching uh, doses of gui- guideline directed medical therapy pillars for heart failure yeah so that's it that's a good question but obviously we had our limitations because the tower unload uh, started enrolling patients in 2017 meaning that uh, the optimal guideline directed medical therapy was different from what we now consider optimal guideline directed therapy. So for instance, SGLT2 inhibitors and um, uh, neprelazine uh, valsartan treatment, that was somewhat underused in this trial, but that was by default because the majority of the patients were enrolled before those drugs became guideline directed medical therapy. That said, all the patients uh, were considered to be on guideline direct on stable guideline directed therapy. And that had to be confirmed by a screening committee. And so the screening committee was looking into the medical therapy that the patient was receiving. And if, for instance, one of the uh, key drugs were not there, then there should be a reasoning why that would be. And also if a patient would require a, a CRT device, for instance, or Um, coronary revascularization that had to be uh, completed prior to enrollment in the study. So we did pay attention to uh, the optimization of the guidelines uh, therapy. And you measured endpoints at what intervals? 
Yeah, that's another very important question because it changed throughout the study. Um, we, we faced quite some challenges with this investigator-initiated study. Um, and one of them was the enrollment pace. Uh, there was not only COVID that at one point hit us, and obviously during COVID, there were less echo, echo studies done. So the diagnosis of moderate aortic stenosis was not as uh, easy or as uh, common commonly done as it is outside of the COVID uh, pandemic. But at the same time, there was also another trial that eventually became competition, which is the PROGRESS trial. And that made it difficult to uh, enroll, um, yeah, to, to find the patients. Uh, but in the beginning, we initially designed the study as a 600 patient trial with the primary endpoint assessment at one year. Because of the slow enrollment and because the follow-up period of those patients was getting longer and longer, we decided to redesign the study and assess the primary endpoint at longest follow-up. So that meant that we would have more events, obviously, and we could reduce the sample size to 300. Unfortunately, uh, at one point, because of the sl relatively slow enrollment, we uh, interrupted uh, study enrollment at the end of 2022, and we ended up with 178 patients in total. And now for the exciting results. Um, what did the yeah. tap unload actually show us? Yeah, so um, let's start with the baseline characteristics. We're talking about elderly patients. So they were in their late 70s. The mean age was 77 years old. One in five were women. The STS score was 4.4, uh, which means that we're talking at at least intermediate operative risk. And uh, patients were quite symptomatic. More than 50% of the patients were either in New York Heart Class 3 or ambulatory New York Heart Class 4. And almost 50% of the patients had a heart failure hospitalization in the year prior to study enrollment. So quite advanced heart failure. And that also was clear from the echo data. The mean valve area, aortic valve area was 1.2 centimeter square with a mean gradient of 22 millimeters of mercury, which is in keeping with what we know and what we accept, accept as moderate aortic stenosis. And the left ventricular and diastolic diameter was 6.6 .6 centimeters, which is quite large. Um, so I think uh, it's fair to say that we were talking about patients with an advanced phenotype of heart failure. And what is also important to note is that approximately 50% of the patients required a dobutamine stress echo, which is also important because that means that a significant number of the patients had low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis, and we, we needed the dobutamine stress echo with all its intrinsic flaws and limitations to determine that these patients were pseudo-severe and had moderate aortic stenosis. But yeah, you know that that is not always an easy assessment. Absolutely. And with respect to the primary endpoints, um, what did we see in the different groups? Yeah. Um, the first thing that I wanted to say is that um, in the TAVR arm, it turned out that the procedure was very safe. So no mortality within 30 days, pacemaker rates less than 5%, no major um, access site complications. So that is very um, uh, reassuring. In the control arm, and the clinical surveillance arm, it is important to note that we see that 39% um, of the patients eventually progressed from moderate to severe aortic stenosis, which is quite significant. And 16 of those patients already in the first year, so that is um, 18%. All the patients who progressed to severe aortic stenosis eventually received a TAVR. And if we look at um, the true crossover patients, so I don't consider patients who evolved from moderate to severe as a crossover because they evolved to a guideline directed indication for valve replacement. But there were also three patients who received a TAVR with still proven moderate aortic stenosis. So those were the actual crossovers. But obviously, the fact that eventually in the control arm also patients are receiving TAVR, that will affect our primary endpoint. Now, let's go to the primary endpoint. Um, it is according to the Finkelstein-Schoenfeld. So what we're doing is we are comparing every patient with all the other patients in the control arm. So every patient in the TAVR arm with all the patients in the control arm. And you start 
with all cause mortality. You look for the, the wins with the, in the tower and the wins in the in the control arm, and then you have the ties. And the ties they proceed then to a comparison in terms of stroke. And then if you have the, the you look at the winners for TAVR, the winners in the uh, clinical surveillance, and the ties again move on to the hospitalizations. We do the same thing, and then the ties go back, go move on to the KCCQ assessment. Eventually, we did not see a difference in all cause death in stroke, but also not in hospitalizations or hospitalization equivalents. We did see. Um, at least numerically, at longest follow-up, more improvement in KCCQ with TAVR than in the control arm. But at the end, overall, the win ratio was 1.31 at longest follow-up with a p-value of 0.143. So basically, there was no significant difference between the two treatment strategies. Again, at longest follow-up. If we would have used our original plan to assess at one year of follow-up, then the win ratio was 1.55 in favor of TAVR with a p-value of 0.032. Obviously, we changed the, the, the sample size. We changed also the power of the study. So that was no longer our primary assessment at one year, but I think it's still worthwhile. No difference in all-cause death, no difference in any of the major adverse cardiac events. But if we then focus on the change in quality of life, then we could see an immediate increase of quality of life, an improvement in quality of life in the TAVR arm of um, 12 uh, points. There was no improvement in the control arm, but as patients in the in the clinical surveillance arm were progressing to severe aortic stenosis. They were receiving a TAVR. And the moment they got TAVR, also their KCCQ improved. So you see the difference in KCCQ between the two treatment strategies declining over time. And at one year, it was still significant. But at longest follow-up, there was no longer a significant difference in quality of life assessment. And we specifically then also looked at the control arm and looked specifically at those patients who did not end up receiving a TAVR. Well, if we look at that, then you basically see a consistent difference in the KCCQs in favor of the TAVR arm. So basically, um, one of the major takeaways is that if you do a TAVR, in, in a patient with HFREF, for moderate or moderate to severe AS, you will see an immediate improvement in uh, the quality of life, but you will not affect the hard clinical endpoints. So I'm just curious to know, um, I know we uh, defined low EF as anything below 50%. Um, and, and yes, the total number of patients ultimately enrolled was smaller than expected, but did you see any trends perhaps by ejection fraction. So was there any trend to a benefit in those with very low ejection fraction as opposed to those with moderately reduced, for example? Yeah, I think that's a that's a very good uh, question. Bear in mind that the mean um, uh, ejection fraction was 39%. And so uh, the heterogeneity testing was not, um, it was too, the sample size was just too small to, to, to have enough patients with very low ejection fractions or with ejection fractions uh, between 40 and 50%. So it was, it was just, yeah, we didn't manage to get, to find enough power to get a signal there. You know, a question that has to be asked is you used a balloon expandable platform. Do you think outcomes would have been any different in using other platforms, self-expanding, so on? Yeah. Um, well, my short answer is no. I don't think that would be a difference because we um, we didn't see anything happening in terms of mortality or hospitalizations. And we did see a significant improvement in um, valve area. So the valve area started with a mean of 1.2 and we ended up with 1.8. Probably with self-expanding, with some of the self-expanding systems, you might you might get, take it to two or 2.1 centimeters square. But uh, I think that the valve, uh, the moderate aortic stenosis per se, was basically not the driver of the outcome. It was the heart failure. 
and it's and I don't think it would have affected uh, our results with uh, a self-expanding valve. And by the way, when we designed the trial and when we started the trial, pacemaker rates with the self-expanding system were, were significantly higher. And obviously, that's not what you want to have, right? You don't want to have your heart failure patients that require um, an RV pacing or a pacemaker in general if it's not really necessary i think now with the new implantation techniques um the pacemaker rates also with the self-expanding valves may be lower maybe in the single digits but um again i think overall i don't see it would affect it would have affected the results but the good thing is that there are two other randomized controlled studies underway right there is the progress that already completed randomization focusing on balloon expandable valves. And then there's the Tavr Expand 2 that is looking at the Evolute valve. And they are fundamentally different from Tavr Unload. Huh? So no longer ejection fraction is a requirement or a low ejection fraction is a requirement to enter the study. Enter now the cardiac damage concept, which is a totally different phenotype of patients that we'll see in those uh, trials. I think um, looking at Tavra and Load, uh, there are some takeaways. I think what this what really plays a role in the outcome and in the interpretation of the outcome is the speed of progression of moderate aortic stenosis. And we were a little bit surprised by yeah. the speed. I think I there were more, I have yeah, to yeah, yeah. There were more patients than anticipated who required a valve replacement for severe aortic stenosis in the clinical surveillance arm. And it attests to the, to the patient population, right? Again, a significant number had low flow, low gradient AS. And then it's not always easy to discern moderate from severe AS. And probably um, a significant number of the patients who entered the trial were already at moderate to severe aortic stenosis when they enter the study. If those kind of patients will be similar in progress and TAVR expand, well, then, then you will also see a lot of TAVR being done in the control arm and that affects the outcome. Agree, absolutely. Well, thank you very much and congratulations to you and your co-investigators for conducting a trial like this. I mean, um, it is something that we were waiting for. Um, so let me ask you this as a final question now that you've completed this trial. Mm -hmm. Your patients with symptomatic heart failure, are you going knowing the progression of disease in them, are you going to refer them sooner than later for TAVR, given that the outcomes were similar and that the procedure was safe? Or would you rather just wait that extra months and years uh, before you refer them for TAVR? Yeah. So that's very relevant. I think we are, uh, to a certain extent, limited by the reimbursement policies, uh, geographical reimbursement policies. That said, I, I do believe that if a patient is symptomatic and has moderate aortic stenosis and there are no other treatment targets available, that I would prefer to treat those patients. Why? Because it is safe. It's we have the proven safety for this indication. So it is safe to treat moderate aortic stenosis. We have no signal of more pacemakers, of embolizations or whatnot. Um, and at the same time, you will immediately improve their quality of life. So I think that that means a lot, I think. Well, thank you very much. And PCR Online, thank you for staying up to speed with all the cutting edge uh, trials that have been presented here at TCT. Thank you very much.